Ms. Murray, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. First off, tell us who were the women of Las Sandinistas. So the women of Las Sandinistas made up almost 30% of the army that fought to successfully overthrow dictator Anastasio Somoza in 1979. Uh, they came from all backgrounds. They were farmers, teachers, lawyers, and uh, many of them were also poets and writers and left their lives, any comfort that they knew to go and fight so that the society could be more just, uh, to fight for a more equal society and risked their lives and, again, successfully overthrew the dictator and then implemented massive social reform uh, throughout the 1980s and fought again in the Contra War and today are fighting again for basic rights in their country. And what attracted you to this subject? So many different aspects of the story attracted me. Uh, what women had done, the incredible uh, lengths they went to to fight for a more just society and how successful they were. Uh, one element that really attracted me was the fact that women were generals. Women like Dora Maria Tellez um, and Daisy Zamora, for example, Monica Boltadano, uh, fought as combatants and generals and led uh, giant battalions that won some of the key battles of the revolution and helped win the war to overthrow the dictator. And then they went on to envision and create these really uh, visionary ministries, really, for health and education uh, that raised literacy by nearly 40% in the first year in 1980. And uh, health care, I mean, really did great things for infant mortality, uh, malaria, preventable disease like polio. Uh, so the society was greatly improved in so many ways from these women's uh, work and vision. You mentioned Dor uh, Dora Maria Tellez. Who was she and how did she get involved in the revolution? Mm -hmm. So Dora Maria got involved at a very young age. Uh, she was a young medical student and she was remarkable. Uh, she had trained in weapons like very casually as a child uh, on a farm basically with her father. But then through her work, uh, especially in poor rural health clinics as a medical student, she saw a great need, I think, to reform the society that, that you know, women whose babies were dying in labor and people that were dying of preventable diseases, it became obvious it was a systemic problem. And that if she just became a doctor in the traditional way, she wasn't gonna be able to help these people. She said they would get sick and just return. And it was really devastating for her. And that's how she became I think more and more involved politically at first just as an assistant to you know the leftist movement and then as the government became more brutal under uh, who they called the dictator Anastasio Somoza uh, throughout the 1960s and 70s she became a leader in her student movements supporting hospital workers and teachers fighting for pensions and, and striking and became more and more radicalized as uh, the dictator's repression became more brutal and I think she took it upon herself uh, to really get more involved and to take the big stride to leave her family, to go underground, to risk everything that she had. Uh, she didn't even tell her family when she was leaving. And yeah, she was, I think, a teenager when she had begun. And then, yeah, by age 22, she was leading the biggest battles and uh, some of the most impressive victories of the Sandinista Revolution. And she knew the risk. Yes. Well. She said one thing that they told you when you joined was you had to be willing to die. And they tested her uh, from what I read. They said, you know, are you ready to go to the mountains? And she knew people died in the mountains. And she was a teenager at this point. And they said, get your backpack and you have to leave tomorrow morning. And they came to test and see if she was ready on the doorstep and she had her backpack. And, and then they said, that was just a test. Now we know that you're going to do it. And so then they began the real training. It was a very, very secretive clandestine movement. And they had to be willing to give up everything. Now, rhetorically, the Sandinistas talked about equality amid imperialism and economic inequality. Why did these women face marginalization after the Zandinistas came to power? Mm. It's a really good question. And the truth is, I don't actually know the answer. That's part of the reason I made the film. Because they rose to such great heights in battle and did such great things, leading ministries for social reform. Uh, it's unclear to me why they couldn't rise further uh, once they had power. Uh, and sadly, what happened was sort of maybe what the opposite of they, they hoped. They had to fight as women to have their own organization. Uh, they had to fight even harder for women's rights in many ways. Uh, so the right to organize and to really um, fight for women's health and women's issues. And also really to stay at the tops of the ministries. Uh, Daisy Zamora was kind of sidelined and harassed sexually, sadly, throughout the 1980s as the Contra War began. And so there were different kinds of marginalization. You know, once the Sandinistas had power, these women, even though they were doing incredible work, were slowly and kind of systematically pushed to the sidelines, many of them, especially the ones willing to question what was going on in the government. 
And how did these women attempt to reshape the society despite, despite them being marginalized? Mm. So, yeah, I think really a lot of these women that I spoke to cared so much more about the ideals than their own power or their own prestige. And that's another thing that really moved me. Success for them was creating a world that was fair for the most people. Um, and giving ex especially kids and, and people in the rural communities access to education and health care uh, and preventative health care. Uh, so I think they, they really were willing to work 24 hours a day. You know, some of them, even with their kids, would bring their kids to the office and just worked constantly to make sure that, you know, these programs were implemented in a very hands-on way um, as widely as they could. So, you know, while they weren't given maybe the highest titles and the the best ranks in the different ministries or in you know the national directorate for example dora maria wasn't considered they asked her to not run you know to be a part of the national directorate candidate you know and there were only men in the nine member national directorate of the fsln and dora maria having done such a great job as a health minister and obviously in the revolution being such a star would have been a natural candidate and wasn't even was essentially asked to leave as many of the women were so I think they kept doing the work because they cared, and it was very effective because they worked so hard. But sadly, they weren't recognized the way that they should have been. But they continued their lives as mothers and in other ways as civil society, too, as well. Absolutely. And some of them were still members of Congress, like Monica Baltadano, for many years until the corruption of the current Sandinista party, I think, made her question, and, and Dora Maria as well. Um, they continued and founded their own parties. Uh, Dora Maria's is called the Sandinista Renovation Movement, the MRS, as it's known and continue to fight. Dora Maria led a hunger strike, you know, in, in uh, the mid-2000s and continues to speak out against what she considers to be undemocratic and unjust practices by the current Sandinista government. Um, and many, yes, still work as mothers, still work writing. Joconda is a very successful novelist, Joconda Belli, and Daisy Moore is a wonderful poet and professor. So many of them continue with very, very interesting and complex lives in spite of the tragedy that they had to live after and during the revolution. Today, these veterans, uh, these women veterans of the revolution are coming together again. What is bringing them uh, back and, and forming coalitions? What's driving that? Mm. I think it's the same thing that really drove them uh, initially. They really want to see a just society. They really want to see Nicaraguans told the truth. They want fair elections. They want transparency and government spending and government policy. And, you know, some, especially Sofia Montenegro, who, was, who still is and was an incredible women's rights activist uh, and is a big part of our film. Uh, what drives her is really equality for women. And you know, under Ortega, sadly, uh, the current Sandinista government, they've outlawed abortion. There's a federal ban, which the Sandinistas have supported. Uh, and there are terrible policies that force women in abusive situations to go into mediation and not be able to prosecute the people that are abusing them and there's a huge rate of femicide, you know, which is the murder of a woman, often by someone close to her, a husband or a boyfriend. And with huge rates of femicide, the fact that Ortega would sign into law something forcing a woman in an abusive situation to wait for help and support from, you know, legal aid is, is incredible and really, really sad. So these women continue fighting because they want the best lives for Nicaraguans and especially Nicaraguan women that they deserve. And how are their efforts being received now? Oh, it's a very, very dangerous situation for many of these women. Uh, Sofia Montenegro and Monica Baltadano were pulled into prison just for convening to protest on the streets this March. Uh, luckily, after a lot of public outcry, they were released from prison. But uh, many students, for example, that protested against pension reforms under the Ortega government were pulled into prison and tortured and held and disappeared. Uh, there are still many people disappeared in that country and hundreds of political prisoners. So these women are under persecution. Again, Dora Maria Teas, her house was just raided. She's on the terrorist list. She's living in clandestinity again. It's, it's almost as she was in the 1970s. So these women, you know, and many of them are in their 60s and 70s, are leading uh, really, really dangerous uh, lives that have great meaning to them, but at the same time put them at, at horrible risk every single day as they fight for what they believe is a more just and more equal society. So Dora is someone you would consider uh, a founding mother of this new government. Mm. Uh, is now almost an exile yes. in, within their own country. Exactly, and, and many see it as a kind of treason or betrayal by her former allies. Someone that again helped found this new government essentially is now being persecuted and considered a terrorist who has to hide uh, to stay alive. And she's going to stay and keep fighting.
What did you learn personally by diving into Las Sandinistas? Mm. I learned so many things. Uh, I learned how, how meaningful a life can be, I think. These women taught me um, all kinds of things, how humane you can be, how bold you can be, um, and really that women can be visionaries and still win a battle and still be a mother and, and live such multifaceted, incredible lives. I mean, these women are, you know, Sophia calls Dora Maria a genius. I mean, many of them have PhDs, have written novels uh, published all over the world and yet still fought for their country in battle, still fought on the front lines for a more equal society and, and had families and were able to do such remarkable things personally and professionally and in battle. So really how wide, how vast, and how dedicated a life can be. And what do you hope audience get out of the film? I hope that, for me at least, and especially as an American, I was reminded uh, how much one individual who bands together with others can really change and how these women, just a few hundred of them at first, fought, and then thousands, but still in a country of a few million, they changed the entire country. And so how powerful one life can be if it's really dedicated and really full of conviction and organized for something, uh, especially something that is really for the benefit of, of something greater than yourself, which these women, I think, all fought for and had no doubt about their commitment to, and, and really did give their lives to women from all classes and all backgrounds was the other thing, I think. We don't have to be limited in our society by where we come from or what we look like. Mm -hmm. I think that we can all come together and find much more in common than we have that, that keeps us separate. With the current humanitarian crisis along the U.S. border and the challenges facing Central America today, mm -hmm. uh, how is this story relevant to what's going on? I think it's incredibly relevant, sadly. I think... Um, and from what I studied, it seems very clear to me that this is a very emblematic crisis in Central America and that the roots of this are responsible for the current crisis that we're experiencing at our borders and in our country. Uh, obviously, in El Salvador, they had a similar issue and similar set of wars you know, over a decade. Uh, and many people had to flee. And the U.S. had a very complicated role in backing regimes. Uh, in Honduras as well, even up to 2009 when there was a coup in Honduras and our government supported the people that put the democratically elected leader on a plane. Uh, essentially, we've had for decades, uh, many, many decades, policies throughout uh, Latin America that have been very detrimental to the majority of the people in many of these countries, um, in Guatemala as well. And so I see, and because that policy continues to this day in many of these countries, uh, where the U.S. has a strong relationship with the government and a very influential relationship. I mean, we see El Salvador in crisis, we see Honduras in crisis, and that is no coincidence. And uh, what I hoped from this film is that that role, the origin of that imperialist policy, which really oppresses people and keeps people ignorant, um, and the country's quite violent, uh, can be remedied and can be countered with diplomatic solutions and dialogue uh, with you know, different individuals in these countries that can really help and help shape policies that are more humane and that allow these countries to be places people want to leave and not flee. Because I believe many of these people don't want to come to our slums, as Noam Chomsky said. Many of these people had beautiful lives in their countries uh, before they were destroyed by policies, uh, which often the U.S. government supports. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Murray. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you.